So I'll sort of come. Um, I'll quickly hand over because we're going to be streaming this live. Uh, there will be people who will be able to watch this from both within the country and uh, outside, and we expect at least to see a little bit of engagement on social media uh, as we proceed. So uh, Nandan is going to be anchoring this process. Uh, people in Bangalore don't need sort of me to introduce Nandan. So because we are. His insatiable curiosity and desire to learn new things, his passion for idea is something very infectious. Uh, also, I think, uh, as, as Aro mentioned, he's, he went to St. Stephen's, I'm Ahmedabad, and Oxford. So he, he's got all the ticks on which colleges you go to in life. Uh, and uh, his last book was on China called Eclipse, which was very successful uh, and I think got a lot of waves. But I think what we need to really respect, Arvind, is uh, how many months, Arvind, since you came here? Seven months. I think uh, for in seven months he's been uh, re remarkably effective in putting his ideas across and getting things done. You know, if a Byzantine uh, time traveler came to Delhi, he wouldn't be able to figure out how to navigate. But he's actually figured out how to navigate uh, India's political economy. He's made allies, made coalitions, reached out to people, earned their trust. So I think uh, we should really credit him for being remarkably effective. And for someone who has never actually worked in India, because I think after I am Ahmedabad, he left and he's not come back. So it's often difficult for people who have worked all their lives abroad to come and settle into this. But he's settled in very well. He's been very effective. And I think uh, today you'll see some of that. So without further ado, I'll request Arvind to make his presentation and then we'll open it up for discussions. Arvind? Should I just, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Ravi here, uh, Nandan, BIC, you know, all, all the, inst the Institute for Human Settlements, and, uh, uh, and to all of you for coming here uh, to this uh, talk. Um, I, I'm delighted to be here in, in, in uh, Bangalore. Uh, it's not a city that I, I know very well. Um, but obviously, it's a, it's a city of the future, uh, maybe of the distant future too. Uh, but it's, it's a city certainly that's kind of uh, humming, with, uh, humming with activity and so on. So, and I know that all of you have this uh, slight uh, contempt uh, for you know, the Babu from... Uh, uh, so, uh, in advance, I plead guilty for being a member of that tribe of Babus from uh, North Block in Delhi. Um, but it's, I think one of the things we forget about Bangalore is that, and maybe I'm committing a faux pas here, you know, this is a city where if you don't start a startup by the age of 25 and sell it by 30, you've probably failed. It reminds me of, a, of, of something that Wolfgang Pauli, the, the, the famous Nobel physicist, you know, used to say about a young physicist, and he would say, you know, oh, so young and still so unknown. And so, so in Bangalore, if you're you know, not a known guy, when you're by the time you're 25, 30, you've not made it. But I think the in interesting thing about Bangalore, which people forget, is that this is a city that you know, owes its you know, current success to, to its humble public sector origins. And, and I think you know, not just those defense retirees who first settled down and made this a city, but you know, uh, the, the public sector uh, companies, public institutions, and all of that. So I think it's a it's really a city that uh, tells you you know how to marry public and private sector. And of course, in London and the ecosphere that he's created, you know you see that coming together. You know how you can ha harness technology and private sector dynamism uh, and and combine it with public policy. And of course, I mean I have no qualms uh, or, or kind of uh, no shyness or reticence uh, about saying that you know. Uh, one of the greatest uh, public policy achievements of the last 20, 30 years has been Aadhaar. So, you know, uh, so this, uh, this is, and Aadhaar combines that 
coming together of the private and public sector. Now, why am I saying all this? I'm saying this to, you know, both to, to praise uh, uh, Bangalore, but also to kind of uh, remind you that it's not just a private sector city and that we humble folk in, in, in New Delhi have a role to play as well. And, and one, uh, uh, one example of this is, you know, the economic survey. Uh, that's something that uh, I want to spend a little bit of time taking you through the economy and highlighting three or four, I think, uh, big issues that I think are very important in the next few months or even the next uh, few years ahead. Um, it's something that I came to know, you know, I've been doing this economic survey outreach in about 10 or 12 cities in India, and I think Bangalore is actually my almost my last stop. And I was in Srinagar doing this, and uh, the, the finance minister of Jammu and Kashmir, Haseeb Drabu, actually he, he was a, a discussant for this, and he came, uh, when he spoke, he said, uh, guess who presented the first economic survey of India? And any, 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 any answers? Uh, you know, uh, Nandan was a famous quiz wizard. Nandan, do you know the answer to this? It's amazing. The first economic survey was actually presented by Pandit Nehru. Yeah, Pandit Ji, who said it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, you know, this is because we had the war with China, and here too. So, so just to just to know that is to is a very kind of humbling experience because you know this is you know it seems all downhill from there. You know, uh, in terms of who's presenting the economic survey. Um, uh, so. Uh, the, the economic survey actually is, uh, I think, is a, is a really important document. It's something that spells out, you know, the state of the economy and all the important issues, you know, in the year ahead. And um, but it's also a, a more important document in terms of creating ideas, setting ideas for policymakers, most of which are routinely ignored, of course. But I think we nevertheless have to make a. So, so let me uh, first of all, I want to say that this is a you know, joint effort, not just by me, but I have a whole team of people working for me and with me, and I just represent the kind of uh, channel through which all this accumulated wisdom and effort that's been done that goes into me. So it's very much a, a collective effort. Now, <clears throat> if I come to uh, a, a private sector city like Bangalore, uh, I have to justify the economic survey. So if someone were to ask me what is the value of the economic survey of, that, I, that we did this year, uh, what would be your answer? And of course, you know, we economists are a very vain lot because we actually don't determine policy. We try and get our kicks from thinking we influence policy. And, and so there's a very famous line, which is the last line of John Maynard Keynes's book, The General Theory, where he says that in the end, it's ideas, not vested interests, that are dangerous for good or evil. So we think we, we generate ideas and we kind of try and derive comfort and satisfaction and indeed vanity from that. So if I were to ask you what is the value of this year's economic survey, my answer to that is $42 billion. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, and how do I justify that? You know, I said it's been subject to the market test. So the economic survey is presented the day before the budget, 27th of February. Um, and it was, it's tabled to Parliament, and it was this year at 12.01 PM. The stock market was you know, treading water until then. And then it's stable, and boom, the stock market takes off. I do my press conference, and boom, it takes off by another 1%. And by the, between the present initial tabling and when I finish my press conference, 2.1% is added to India's stock market valuation. And that's $42 billion. Uh, and I don't want to tell you what happens after the budget speech is presented, <laughs> because my boss will be very unhappy with me after that. So. But uh, jokes apart, you know, this is a, uh, this is a street, this is a kind of light uh, prefatory remark. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, the, the economic survey has two volumes. And this year we departed from it by, uh, you know, usually it's one volume and one second volume is full of tables. Uh, I actually decided to depart from that and say, you know, break it up into two. Where volume one was much more analytical, forward looking uh, and prescriptive bit. Volume two was much more backward looking, and both have a role to play. You know, you have to understand the past in order to, you know, uh, make sense and be, you know, make predictions about the future. Um, I, I would say the economic survey has, you know, three roles to play. You know, it's a repository of facts and data. Uh, it's a technical analysis. But above all, I do think that it must be an ideas generating document. And you know, 
um, regardless whether it's ignored or not, I think it's incumbent upon us to, you know, present ideas to policymakers and, and see how they, and also try and sell them in a way that uh, it's going to make uh, policy, I mean, make it appealing to policymakers to at least consider seriously and also, uh, God forbid, implement it also as well. So, um, <clears throat> Um, so, so let me begin by saying, you know, the, the background to this year's economic survey was really, you know, the big sweet spot, uh, and we said that this is a moment that comes but rarely in history, where, you know, basically a combination of a, you know, relatively strong political mandate, uh, we're discovering that that political mandate is perhaps not strong enough, uh, but it's a political mandate uh, combined with this external environment which, you know, the external environment had a couple of interesting dimensions. First, the fact that oil prices were down, which really creates, uh, gives India a lot of fiscal space uh, to do a lot of good things. But it's also uh, interesting in that, you know, we're at a juncture in history, um, in recent economic history, where actually India seems to be amongst the brightest spots, you know, in the world, on the world horizon. You know, China is slowing down. Uh, Europe is in trouble. You know, God knows what, I don't know what happened what's going to happen today in Greece. Uh, we may be seeing the last throws of the Eurozone as, as we've known it. Um, good chance that that might happen. Uh, in any case, even if it doesn't uh, explicitly, it's going to be a lot of uh, volatility and turbulence in, in Europe. Um, uh, Brazil is in a funk. South Africa is, you know, un unemployment is very high. Russia, of course, is, you know, uh, Putin is messing around with the place. And, you know, in that sense, and the U.S. is one of the, you know, few dynamic spots in the world economy, but China, but India is up there. So it's really a very attractive investment destination for, you know, domestic and foreign investors. So it's the combination of that political mandate plus that benign environment, which we said creates the possibility of achieving sustainable double-digit growth. And, of course, when I say double-digit growth, you know, uh, there's a Beatles song with a little help from my friends. Yeah, it's a bit a little help from the statistics office. You know, maybe we can get uh, uh, a, a, a double-digit growth in India. So, so it's essentially what you know. I think this growth is absolutely imperative in India for two reasons. One, you know, wiping every tear from every eye, which is the fact that you know we have to create uh, protect the poor and the vulnerable. And I think growth is very important for that. And I'm going to talk about that uh, later on. But also because, you know, this is an India, the India that, you know, I sort of grew up in or when I graduated from after my MBA, it, the, you know, uh, I got a job uh, in, in, in not a bad place, but I was paid a handsome sum of 1,700 rupees for my job. Uh, uh, but there weren't that many opportunities then. But today India is very different. You know, it's young, it's middle class, it's aspirational. Uh, of course, it's still Rohini stubbornly male, and I think we need to fix that. But, but, but you know, it's it's a different India, and we need to create opportunities. And there, I think growth is is, is absolutely fundamental. Double-digit growth is absolutely fundamental, and, and I think that's I think the background to this uh, economic survey, this sweet spot in uh, recent history. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm I'm mindful that. You know, Anything that I say promising about the future will always be seen relative to a recent past, and I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying as, you know, uh, you know, don't make too many relative uh, uh, judgments about what I'm saying. I just want to uh, talk about the future and, you know, not make any comments about the recent past. Um, so the question is, you know, if you recall the, the, the um, background to the budget, you know, there was a lot of expectation it, just before the budget. The economist had this big picture of the elephant and two, you know, engines and is it poised for takeoff? And I mean, I really did want to moderate the expectations quite considerably because I, I mean, the the simple fact was that you know, if you look at cross country history of the last 35, 40 years, which you know I've studied on and off in the last 10, 15 years. What you find is that these expectations were very unrealistic because we know that big bang reforms, which is what the world was expecting, there are two conditions for big bang reforms to happen. One, you know, usually reforms happen uh, around crises, around economic crises. Uh, you know, if you remember the famous saying, Rahm Emanuel, who was Obama's uh, chief of staff, uh, when, when the crisis hit, he said, you know, never waste a crisis. So uh, the, the, the implication being that big things happen only around crises. And the second thing you find, observe, is that the, the uh, uh, finding is that you big bang reform generally in, in, in democracy.
democracies, in robust democracies. But, so the point is that India was, has, is not in crisis, was not in crisis. So, so the expectation of big bang reforms is actually uh, uh, quite unrealistic. And, and also India, as you all know, is, is a vibrant, frustratingly vibrant democracy, multiple centers of power, multiple veto points, uh, and, and actually power completely dispersed. You know, uh, one of the things that I've learned over the last seven years is you know, for all the talk about centralization of power under the government, uh, I think the irony is that how difficult it is to centralize power in New Delhi. You know, power is just completely dispersed, not just vertically between the center and the states, but horizontally across institutions, across the bureaucracy, across regulatory institutions as well. So it's really very difficult uh, to actually think about big bang reforms in India. Uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, we didn't want to use this as an alibi for not doing things. And I think the standard that I certainly think that we should hold this government or any government to is to say that in the areas, levers that the central government controls, do we see some decisive shifts? And in the areas that, that are much more difficult to reform, do we see a persistent, encompassing, and creative incrementalism? Uh, you know, so that combination of change where you control the levers and incrementalism where you, you don't control it so easily, that's the standard against by which I think we should assess this government or any other government. You know, and when I say this persistent and creative incrementalism, someone said, Arvind, you, you, you know, you make incrementalism sound sexy, but that's not, I think, the point. The point is that, you know, it is unreasonable to expect, uh, you know, uh, too much movement uh, in areas where the central government doesn't control. So, so I think that's against which we should government going forward, not over short periods of time, but over a, a longer duration, a longer, a wider window. And we'll have to see that over the next few years, whether the standard is met or not. So, so this is a kind of elaborate, uh, uh, sorry, elaborate kind of background to this. But let me jump into, uh, I'll quickly run through what I think are what is the macroeconomic outlook for India over the, over the coming year? But, and then talk, uh, I mean, I'm going to talk to you about two or three big, uh, you know, ideas in the economic survey, and I want to elaborate on them uh, in, in the time uh, remaining. The economic outlook for the short run is, is you know, you all know, you know um, inflation has come down dramatically. Our external situation has improved. Uh, you know, stock prices, despite the recent correction, are you know have been good because investor sentiment has been. You know, there is a kind of more put uh, that uh, we've seen over the last 12 to 18 months, uh, and growth. You know, I'm going to talk about this in a second, which had decelerated for about 12 or 13 quarters, has bottomed out, and you can see signs of a pickup more recently. So, so all the macro indicators in India are looking, uh, uh, you know, positive uh, going forward. Um, I think inflation, which is, I think, a big concern, uh, is, is, is relatively under control. And uh, uh, what we said in the economic survey was that, you know, that the forecast, certainly our forecast is for inflation to be about 5 to 5.5%, five uh, which, you know, meant that there's a lot of that says some space for monetary easing. And, and you know, I wrote a piece in, in the Indian Express recently um, asking, you know, how we should think about monetary policy at a time when you know different indicators of inflation are diverging very widely. I, I think there's a, a serious analytical discussion to be had there. You know, I don't want to go too much into it because you know it, it will uh, start to seem like you know uh, North Block and, and Mint Street are, are kind of at loggerheads on interest rate policy. Uh, the, the, that's not the case at all. I think uh, relations are very good, and uh, uh, I want to assure you that you know. Uh, there's no scandal brewing or no discord or, or conflict that you know you need to to be uh, alert to. Uh, but I do think there is an analytical question here uh, that needs to be discussed. You know, it's amazing how this is you know the, the real interest rate, which is the nominal interest rate minus inflation, and generally you know when all the indicators of inflation move in the same direction, you know it's not an issue. But now what's happened is that you know. In indicators of inflation have diverged dramatically. Uh, CPI inflation is about five and a half percent, but wholesale price inflation is you know minus two point five percent. So if you look at the real interest rate, you know, uh, which is a measure of the monetary policy stance, you know, there's huge divergence. So the question is analytically, how should we be thinking about this? And and I think there's a serious 
uh, analytical discussion to be ha had there. Uh, I don't want to say too much more on that. So I think uh, it, it, these are very interesting times to uh, to be. Uh, you know, I'm sure Raghu is having a, a bit of a hard heart trying to parse the data because the data are uh, not easy to read uh, these days. Now on growth. Let me let me tell you what my uh, the way I think about economic growth in, in the next few in the next few quarters or the next year. The official number today is that India is growing at something like 7.3, 7.4 percent. Outlook for the next year is that you know growth is going to be higher than this uh, by about half or somewhere between half and one percent. And the reason why I say growth is going to be greater because of three or four reasons. One, I think that um, uh, the government has done reform, which should I think kick in. Um, we find that you know uh, interest rates are coming down, which is also should be uh, positive for uh, for the economy. Uh, oil prices have come down, so I think uh, that's also it's oil price declines are like a tax cut, so that should also help the economy. So. All these things mean that the economy next year will grow more rapidly than last year. Now, the question arises, what is that number for growth? In the economic survey, we said it's between eight and eight and a half is what we expect for next year. Uh, now, the question is that, does India seem like an economy that's growing at eight, eight, eight and a half? And the answer to that, my honest answer is, I don't know. Um, uh, I think we do need to understand the data better. But all I can say, and I think it's completely consistent to say that I don't understand the growth numbers completely in terms of you know, whether it's seven and a half or eight, but I'm reasonably confident to say that this year was better than last year. Last year was better than the year before. And this year is going to be better than last year by more than last year was better than the previous year. So, so, that's, my, so, so you know, that's my forecast for growth uh, for this year. Again, and there's no inconsistency at all uh, between saying that and between and, and also saying that, you know, I'm unsure whether it's eight or eight and a half or seven and a half or six old series, new series and all these complications. So, so I just want to make that uh, uh, very clear and there's no mystery at all. Um, let me tell you what the one thing that worries me, the, the big challenge for India, and this is a city that I, I want to make this in a city which is kind of, um, uh, which is, you know, which uh, the city should hear this this important message. You know, one of the things I hadn't realized was our export performance has really flattened out. And it's not just in manufacturing, but it's in services that export performance also has flattened out. The ratio of exports of services to GDP, which is this red line, basically after growing in dollar terms for almost 30% a year for about eight to nine years, now the share of exports to GDP has flattened out, maybe even declining. And that's really worrying. And if you think about the, uh, a flip side of that is how responsive are our exports to what's happening in the world? And what you find is that our export, the, the export, which this basically tells you for one percentage point growth in world demand, how much do our exports grow by? And that's plummeted quite sharply. So if you think about it, the external environment is deteriorating because, you know, as you know, the world is slowing down for all the reasons. Uh, but moreover, our responsiveness to that uh, growth has also come down. So in a sense, you know, there's something here going on in our, on our export side, including services exports, IT exports, which I think we need to understand much more. Part of it, of course, is that, you know, I've told you growth is going down. Our, our trading partners are also following you know, very competitive exchange rate policies, kind of what we call beggar thy neighbor policies, which we need to respond to. But I think there's also something uh, more fundamental, you know, in terms of our own competitiveness of our, even our services sector uh, that, you know, I have to hear your views on. But this is something that I, I think is a challenge which we need to be uh, alert to going forward. Um, now, so, so this is my outlook for, for you know, in macroeconomically stable, reforms are underway. And, and you know, so growth is going to be better this year, and so I think it's it's a uh, and amongst the major risks, I don't think that you know uh, the Fed, U.S. Fed raising rates is is a big risk for our uh, economy. Uh, I think we're sufficiently cushioned. I, I do worry a little bit more about the longer term trade or challenge for our economy, uh, especially in services. 
So, so that's by way of background. Now I want to touch upon, I think, two or maybe three ideas in the economic survey, and then I'll throw it open for questions. I, I hope I'm not, uh, I hope I still have your attention here. Huh? Take, my, take my time, okay? So one of the contributions of the economic survey, I would claim, is that, you know, we made a, a big pitch for public investment in this year's budget. And as it turned out, the budget has increased the allocation of public investment. But the reason we made it was actually quite, um, um, uh, it was not the typical case for public investment. It's very India specific and very circumstantial. Now, there's a case for public investment in all economies. You know, there are st there's stuff that the private sector will not do. And I think, so that's the positive case for public investment, connectivity, roads, railways, etc., that need to be built. But I think at this juncture, there was also what I call a negative or a push factor towards public investment, which is really that, you know, private investment, uh, the outlook for private investment is actually quite, has been uncertain. And that's because, you know, this is, uh, numbers on stalled projects as a fraction of GDP, you know, the Indian corporate sector at the moment, you know, is not exactly super healthy and super robust. Um, debt equity ratios are high and rising amongst the highest in the emerging market world. Many companies have interest coverage ratios less than one. So they're not exactly in a position to invest uh, a lot. And of course, the counterpart of that is the balance, the banking system is also uh, relatively uh, the balance sheets are, are, are not very strong. So the combination of, you know, corporate balance sheets and, um, and banking balance sheets being relatively uh, not so healthy means that the outlook for uh, private investment is going to remain uncertain. Uh, there's just a conceptual point here which uh, I want to flag, uh, something that Nandan might appreciate. You know, if you think about stalled projects in India, and you know, the fact that, you know, it's hanging over the economy like this, you know, millstone around the neck. You know, what would happen in, in most economies like this is that you would have legal mechanisms for exit. And this is, um, you know, the problem in India, the way I see it is that on the one hand, exit mechanisms are not so strong. You know, the debt recovery tribunals, the Sarfazi Act, bankruptcy laws, you know, uh, and that's the sense in which we're, we're, we're still an economy with weak institutions. In this case, with weak institutions for exit. You know, in a sense, if you were if you were to ask me, what one of the big conceptual problems in India is that you know we have capitalism without exit. You know, I think that I think is something. That, you know, uh, I, I haven't come up with. I think there's a nice uh, kind of uh, witty line that's waiting to be said about. Capitalism without exit is something without something. I haven't been able to think about that, but I'll come to that sometime. But this is capitalism without exit, which I think is. So the interesting thing is that on the one hand, we have weak institutions of exit, which makes it difficult. But I think what is new and what I've learned in the last seven months is that we have crazily strong and perverse institutions in another way, which makes the, this exit very difficult. And that is, you know, this, uh, the, the kind of, the almost crazy zealous, uh, uh, zealousness, zealotry, or whatever you want to say, of these, you know, other institutions that has actually led to, you know, paralysis in decision making. So it's a combination of weak institutions in one, on, one, on the one hand, and super strong institutions like the CBI, the CVC, and all this on the other. So it's a, it's a really unique mix which makes exit out of this very difficult. And I, I think that's why this is a problem that requires a creative solution. In the economic survey, we said, you know, maybe we need to have, you know, maybe we need to convert this into a very explicitly political process to do that via, say, an independent renegotiation commission or whatever. But this is, so for me, as, as someone who studied institutions and growth across countries, this is actually very interesting that, you know, we have this problem. What I've called this the balance sheet syndrome with Indian characteristic. It, it has this feature of holding back private investment. But I think it's because of this combination of weak and strong institutions that we're not able to get out of this very easily. So that, I think, is, and that's why we made this case for public investment. So there's a positive case for public investment, but there's a uniquely Indian case also for public investment based on this, this 
So that's one <coughs> kind of, uh, I would claim, one kind of big idea in the budget. And I think uh, in the survey, which uh, to some extent was followed up on uh, in the budget. So that, I think, is an interesting aspect about India today. So that's idea number one, I think. Uh, idea number two, I would say, is, you know, uh, is the 14th Finance Commission. This is not an idea from the survey, uh, this, or nor is it uh, something in uh, uh, a policy of the government, except in one sense, I will say. This is really something that the 14th Finance Commission uh, did for uh, public finances in India. And I do think that this is a watershed for federalism in India. It's really a, and I think um, why it's, it's a watershed, uh, I'm going to explain in a second, but I think it's radically going to change the Indian landscape going forward. Essentially, what the 14th Finance Commission did, as you know, is to give about 1% of GDP more in untied taxes to the states. It's, it's actually very odd. You go around the country, all the states are saying, or many of them are saying, oh my God, the you know, center is giving us less, center is giving us less. And I think it's kind of a strategic amnesia on their part because this is 1% of GDP which they've been given untied. Uh, and, and they've kind of forgotten about that completely. But what they focus on is that because in order to make this work for the center, which is given away 1%, the center had to cut back to some extent on the on what's called the, the, the plan transfers, uh, you know, what uh, the planning commission transfers. And I think on balance, the center did still give away more than it's uh, withdrawing by way of public transfers. Uh, and so net, there's still a, a, a boost to state finances. But of course, states have uh, interpreted it differently, and, and that's something I think that the, the, the government will have to. I, I think what is not appreciated enough is how difficult it was for the government to accept the recommendation of the 14th Finance Commission, precisely for this reason that you know states would pocket the untied transfers on the tax on the one hand, and would claim that you know the center is being very bad and withdrawing this stuff, and that's exactly to some extent how it's playing out. So. I think accepting it was actually a very bold decision on the part of the government. And it's going to change, fundamentally going to change federalism because remember that the, so more money to the states, states are more empowered, less spending by the center and much more of the spending to be determined uh, by the states. So on both the tax and the expenditure side, we're seeing actually a huge change a radical, dramatic change in the way Indian public finances are going to be done. And I think that's going to be a, a big plus for, for India going forward. Why do I think it's going to be a big plus in terms of federalism? You know, if you, if you think about, if you look at, if you analyze the history of Indian, uh, how India's economy, India economy and politics has evolved o over time, I mean, you see uh, um, progressively, you know, decentralization of India, you know, becoming much more, you know, both in a political sense and in an economic sense, power has over time flowed uh, to the states. And the one exception to that was in fact, uh, you know, the last uh, five to 10 years where, you know, through these centrally sponsored schemes, we saw a clawback of the natural tendency towards decentralization because the center was, you know, determining what to spend, how to spend. And I think what this 14th Finance Commission has done or has actually forced is to you know correct that elaboration of the last five to ten years, and, and, and in that sense, you know, there's going to be much more uh, federal. Now, why do I think it's a good thing? You know, I think that you know, cooperative federalism is in the future. Uh, I think the GST that you're going to see, which started under the previous government, we're seeing an example where you know the center and the states are coming together to do a tax that you know is going to imply you know uh, you know. Uh, a pooling of sovereignty, a kind of experiment in pooling sovereignty, which is quite remarkable. I think if, if the GST goes through, and we're all hoping it will, uh, it will be that you know um, states are giving up some autonomy in, in determining taxes, but in return they get uh, other things. And of course, some states will gain more, some states will gain less. Uh, and this, but you know, just coming together to doing this cooperatively is something that's going to be very. Uh, very positive in India, and, and you're going to get this cooperative federalism model. I think, for example, the whole uh, empowered committee, which is determining these things, the GST, is, is an excellent example of an institution which, which is you know, meant to deal with and facilitate uh, uh, cooperative federalism. Uh, I, I don't want to go into this chart, uh, you know, it just shows that uh, you know, it's not very important. But I think 
what is really interesting is that in India, we're not just going to get cooperative federalism, but more and more what I call competitive federalism. I think if you look at what has happened over India in the last, I don't know, two uh, 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 10, 15 years, we've seen that sort of the agent of change and dynamism has been competitive federalism, i.e., you know, states compete with each other uh, to attract talent, capital, et cetera, and that's the mechanism through which uh, this is happening. You know, the way to conceptually think about cooperative competitive federalism is that, you know, individual states act as models and magnets for change. You know, models because, you know, no longer can someone say, uh, you know, you cannot solve the electricity problem because Gujarat has shown that it can be done. So that's an example of, of a model. You know, uh, Chhattisgarh has a, a very good public distribution system. So no, no one can say, you know, uh, you know, states cannot reform their public distribution systems. So that's, you know, um, uh, states acting as models for change. But then there's the other thing about states acting as magnets of change. You know, if one state does well, it's going to draw in capital labor technology and force a change on the others. You know, uh, if you remember Gujarat and the Nano, uh, e-governance in Andhra Pradesh, Rajasthan labor laws, for example, now one state doing it, other states are emulating it. You know, as I like to say, even Mamta Bajji, I think, goes around saying now we have fewer strikes in, uh, you know, West Bengal, you know, you know, in order to attract, you know, uh, investment to, to, to her state. So uh, I think so, so that's going to be a really powerful agent of change in India as India uh, federalizes more and more. But what is interesting and very heartening, I think, is that that is combined with the fact, so that's on the economic side, you know, competitive federalism, but on top of that we have democratic politics is facilitating this. You know, um, Indians are generally, you know, I think many Indians, they look at Delhi and all the, you know, the, the, the bureaucracy and this, and no question that if I were to poll you, eight out of ten would be really wistful about the Chinese model of decision, you know, centralized decision making, forced through, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, Queen is an exception. You know, she has a. Uh, uh, but in that sense, I think you know. But we we have for better or bad, we have our democracy, and therefore change has to happen through democratic politics. And the good news is that democratic politics is more and more facilitating competitive federalism, uh, and. You know, I, I, I like to say that, you know, increasingly in India, good economics is becoming good politics. And see, not all the time, not everywhere in every state, but on average, this is research done by Milan Vaishnav at the Carnegie Center. What he does is that he plots growth against uh, how much is the change in seat share for the incumbent politician. In the 80s and 90s, it's either the wrong direction or no effect at all. Because remember, anti-incumbency was a was a feature of Indian politics. What that meant is that regardless of how the rascals did, you you know they were voted out of power. Uh, but but in the 2000s, what you find is that the higher the growth, the more the incumbent gains seats. So this is, I think, the 2014 election. Some would say is an example of you know. Uh, good governance uh, and bad governance being penalized and the promise of good governance being uh, rewarded. So this is increasingly happening in India uh, and you know uh, another way of, picture of, of depicting this is that basically chief ministers who delivered high growth were re-elected while those with weak growth figures were not and you know uh, always begin with uh, Gujarat and uh, you know and these are the other states. Um, uh, my, my finance minister, my boss, uh, recently uh, uh, told me a statistic which kind of corroborates this. All the state chief ministers who've, had, uh, who've been re-elected for three terms, those who've delivered agricultural growth at more than 7 or 7.5%. Seven so in a sense, what it tells you is that you know, democratic politics is increasingly becoming a lot about economics. And I think if this continues, I, th I think this is going to be very good. So, so just to step back, the 14th Finance Commission accepting that, you know, unleashes both cooperative and competitive federalism, and that competitive federalism is being rewarded. So in a sense, therefore, I would argue that, you know, uh, accepting the 14th Finance Commission is this long-term structural change for the better for India going forward. 
So that's idea number two. Idea number one was why public investment. Uh, idea number two is, you know, uh, the consequences of the 14th Finance Commission and what it means for Indian feminism. And last, you know, <clears throat> how can I come to Bangalore and have Nandan chairing this uh, and not talking about the third big idea, which is, you know, what we call, you know, uh, the JAM Trinity solution. Uh, essentially, you know, this table is, it's, it's actually quite remarkable, you know, when you actually see this table, you see how much and what a variety of goods and services India does subsidize. And this is the fiscal cost and so on. But this tells you, you know, we calculated for each of these subsidies how much actually reaches the poor. And if you take kerosene, for example, something that we studied more closely, you know, in the case of kerosene, there are three kinds of leakages, as it were. One is what I would call, you know, gross kerosene. You know, the center gives the states kerosene, and it doesn't even show up in the, in the numbers, in the consumption numbers. That's leakage number one, ghost kerosene. Second source of leakage is that you, states get kerosene, but it, it shows up in, in the consumption, but not in PDS consumption. But after all, all this money is given in order to subsidize the PDS system. The third source of leakage is that it does show up in the public distribution system, but actually doesn't go to the people who need it the most. So if you kind of do a rough and ready calculation of uh, how much actually is uh, the, the intended targeted beneficiary, which are the poor, you find that you know uh, it's, it's actually uh, not very high, and surely there must be more effective ways of doing this. Now, I want to present some uh, uh, recent research that uh, we've done, Siddharth George, uh, a Columbia student, and uh, some of us have done, is jam in action. You know, this is what has happened to the uh, cooking gas experiment, as it were. If you remember, cooking gas was started by your government, then it was, was suspended, and then it was reintroduced. Uh, you know, I, no, no, I, I don't, I, 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 no, so sorry, I, I didn't mean, I, 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 let, let me be clear. I, I think uh, Nanda's government gets a lot of credit for introducing this. Some minus marks for abandoning it, and, and, and the new government gets credit for you know, uh, embracing it with, with uh, a, a lot of vigor. So I think one has to be fair about this. I mean, and of course, Aadhaar was, of course, started by the previous government. So uh, I, I don't want to uh, sound at all partisan in any uh, non-defensible way. I, if I can be partisan in a defensible way, I'll describe it, but not in a non-defensible way. Um, what we find is this, this is very interesting. This chart, what it says is that when, uh, you know, when, we, uh, when the DBT was direct transfers for cooking gas was introduced, this compares what happens in those districts where DBT was introduced with those places, the blue, where it was not introduced. And when DBT is introduced, boom, this is subsidized sales drop, which is basically, you know, a lot of ghost connections. When, it's, when it was suspended, it boom, it jumps back up again. So this is a really very effective scheme, the DBT. And when you do this also for the, the most recent incarnation, you find this very strong. What you find is that domestic sales, subsidized sales, are reduced by about a quarter which, um, you know, results in, in quite a savings. So I think this is, you know, so just stepping back from this, I do think of, you know, JAM, you know, Jandhan, Aadhaar, Mobile, what we call, as really, of course, building upon Aadhaar, which is absolutely the backbone for this. I do think of JAM as, you know, one of the silent, uh, but really quiet and deep, revolutions that's happening in India in, in many, many ways. Uh, and so, you know, I, 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 I think we should all be very excited about this experiment going forward. Um, now, what are the lessons we can take away from what we've learned about this cooking gas for, you know, the next steps in this DBT? And sure, I think a note of, you know, caution is in order. One of the things we think is that this cooking gas subsidy is not immediately transferable to say the next one, the kerosene. There are lots of differences between cooking gas and kerosene. You know, for example, in the case of cooking gas, the distribution is done by the center. Kerosene is going to be done more by the states, which is going to complicate matters quite a lot. Co cooking gas, all households in principle are eligible, but uh, kerosene only the poor. And I'm going to talk about what challenges it remains, uh, creates. 
vulnerability, no kerosene is for the poor, whereas LDG was for the middle class. So that I think when I said that uh, you know this reduces sales substantially, we have to be careful to ensure that genuine beneficiaries are not also excluded from this, and that's politically very important. Otherwise, you know, you introduce the scheme. If it excludes genuine beneficiaries, you get a political problem, and then all of the EBT can be discredited. I think we have to be very careful about that going forward. And so the way um, I think, and this is something I've learned actually interacting with, uh, you know, Nandan and all the groups here in, in Bangalore, like iSpirit and others, is that conceptually I think <clears throat> Jam has to, to realize the Jam vision, which I think is really an amazing vision absolutely transformational in its possibilities for India, and I'm going to tell you why, is that I think that what I would call there are two sets of challenges that need to be overcome. One is what I would call the first mile challenge, precisely because it's not a universal uh, you know, subsidy. You have to target, which means you have to identify who the beneficiary is. Not everyone is uh, eligible, so you have to find out who is eligible, and so you need to track and identify who is eligible, and that's, you know, we have multiple ways of doing it, you know, different uh, definitions, rosters, different states. And so we have to, you know, have this key infrastructure to identify beneficiaries and to coordinate it across government in New Delhi, but also across the states, you know, because we have to do this for kerosene and eventually for other goods. And, and it's a really complicated business. So I think that's the first mile challenge to realize jam. And then there's the last mile challenge, which is the whole you know, uh, financial inclusion problem. That is, if you start the scheme and money doesn't reach bank accounts, you have a problem. You start the scheme, money reaches the bank accounts, but people can't access these bank accounts, you have, still have a problem. So I think that's, you know, taking financial inclusion to that last step, the last mile, I think is, is going to be a big challenge as well, and that requires lots of technology solutions, a lot of public policy support, you know, payment banks, mobile money, a network of business correspondence. You know, uh, I'm spouting this, not that I understand these very well, I'm just spouting what I've picked up in Bangalore in the last few days. But, but really, I think this really does need to um, uh, happen, and I think with enormous possibilities. Now, why do I think this is, you know, important? Uh, I think DBT is important, I think, in three, at least three very fundamental ways, the jam thing, not just the jam vision. One, I think, of course, is, you know, very mundane level at which, you know, government saves money, and, and that's part of it, of course. But I think there is a sense in which government gets legitimized and strengthened if it's able to show that it can deliver some services effectively. And I think the last thing we want to happen in India is a discrediting of government and a cynicism about government in general, because as I said, even Bangalore is, 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 the healthy, is a result of a healthy partnership between the public sector and the private sector. So I think that's one. So I think uh, it's going to be enormous benefits for uh, savings in the government. Second, of course, uh, I think it's going to be terribly important for the economy, which is that you know, if you think about this table that I showed you, is you know, it's very fashionable amongst economists to talk about you know second and third generation reforms. And if you look at this chart, it's something that struck me doing this is we really haven't done our first generation reforms. First generation reform, um, the rudiments of a market economy is that all agents, producers, and consumers must face market prices if you want the market to work. And if you think about it, we, haven't, we don't have that. So it just, it just to get you know, first generation of form going, and this is only possible if we can do EBT. So from the point of view of the economy as a whole, I, I think you know, to gain the efficiency benefits of a market economy, we need to have this. So that's the second important benefit. And of course, the third and perhaps the most important benefit is that you know, if we're spending so much you know, to actually get it to the people who need the most in a timely fashion, uh, you know, in the in the magnitude that are required, I, I think this is you know absolutely uh, terribly important. So, so what I I, I think um, the way I, I view this jam is that you know if you think about uh, cash transfers as you know effective development policy, um, 
it began actually with Mexico's Progresa uh, scheme. Then it tra traveled to Brazil with the Bolsa Familia scheme, so very, you know, the both conditional cash transfers. Now, you know, it has the potential now to reach one seventh of humanity because of JAM. And I think that's why this is, you know, in, in a kind of development sense, this is quite exciting and, and full of possibilities. So, so just to summarize, you know, uh, 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 the outlook for the economies is not bad. Uh, and, and some of the ideas in the survey I've sketched out, you know, case for public investment, uh, why um, the 40th Finance Commission was so important, and of course, the JAM vision. The economic survey has much more. Uh, I would urge you to uh, read it cover to cover uh, and, and uh, go out and buy it. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, thank you very much for listening and uh, delighted to answer questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Arvind. That was uh, fantastic. I think we all, we never thought economics, were, econ economics was so interesting, but you made it <laughs> interesting for us. A uh, couple of questions that uh, I thought I'll ask before we open up. You know, as I mentioned, I think you have been uh, remarkably effective in seven months in uh, gaining trust, building coalitions, getting your idea across. So, how do you take uh, an idea which is a dry economic idea and translate that into political currency to convince policy makers? Give, give a couple of examples of how you rephrase things and do that well. Uh, see, f f firstly, Ramdan, you know, in, in this, one has to have a you know, little bit of uh, hum humility and modesty about one's own. I think it's all, it's all relative, you know, to say that, you know, this changed the world is completely something that I wouldn't say at all. I, I think we, uh, you know, contribute in small, small ways. But I think the question you raise is uh, um, a very good one. And, and I, I think. One thing I've learned about government is that, you know, for all the uh, criticisms and cynicism about government, um, there is a huge gray space between what you're told you must do and what you're told you cannot do. You know, there's a huge uh, gray space for, I would say, opportunistic, uh, you know, creativity and so on. And, and I think in this. Uh, so in the case of, uh, let me tell you the case of public investment, for example. I think that was a case that was just ripe objectively. And I think we just came along and did that. Uh, and they were already kind of, uh, were only eager to get that message. Because in some sense, if you think about it, um, when, when the government is anxious to do things, this lever, public investment is a lever that it can pull easily. So you just exploit that uh, uh, because you know that private investment is going to be very difficult. Uh, and, and so, and, you know, it, it also coincided with the fact that uh, we had a railway minister, a new dynamic railway minister who had plans for public investment. So, you know, getting him on board was also uh, a, a use, having him there was very useful. So, so I would say that, you know, the, the other thing I think which is very important then is that I think what you have to recognize and be aware of, of is what are the political economy constraints that are like Lakshman races that you cannot cross. You know, I think that's something that you have to be sensitive to. So for example, if you want to advocate a policy on agriculture, uh, you have to articulate it in terms that you know takes account of the less in rural India now. And the fact that you know farmers are really need to be protected, you need to minimize those constraints. So, for example, if you take the recent decision of uh, the government on the uh, uh, support price increases, which was a was an excellent decision, because what the government did last week was to announce increases in in, in the prices for food, especially rice and pulses. And what was interesting about that was. Um, there was a certain constituency which wanted, you know, much bigger uh, increases, uh, you know, for certain crops. Um, and the challenge was, you know, how do you, you know, uh, advise uh, the powers that be on, on what to do and what not to do and why. So for instance, of pulses, for example, it was, you know, clear that uh, the, the inequity that we have in our current system between seal growing and pulses, big inequity in the system that needed to be corrected. 
And the fact that pulses prices were increasing very rapidly provided the political opportunity to actually articulate it as a moment when you know, this inequity between the could be rectified. So, so that's the kind of you know, messaging that one can use to do that. And as you see, what the government did was it, it moderated generally prices for most crops in a way that you know, would safeguard the inflation objectives of the country, but at the margin rectified this imbalance by awarding higher increases for pulses because pulses are something we grow, we need to incentivize farmers much more. It's actually much better for, it, it's, it's a nutrient that fixes, so you, India needs to grow more pulses and less cereals, uh, and this decision is now by rectifying that imbalance. But again, the opportunity was provided by objective circumstances. Uh, one more question, uh, which I thought of, and it's also here, is you are quite confident that if there's a, the interest business in the US, paper and all that, if the interest rates are rising, uh, a lot of people believe that a substantial part of the inflow will stop because it's more attractive, especially on the side, not so much equities. But you seem quite confident that uh, interest rates in the US may not make a difference. Can you explain that? Yeah. Uh, 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 to some extent, I'm confident that I'm just channeling Raghu's confidence as well, I think, uh, <laughs> in, in this. Uh, but but l l l l let, me, let me say why, to, uh, I think, Two, two or three reasons why I think this will be. You see, I think we have a tendency to extrapolate the recent past. So, in a sense, I think we're fighting. It's a it's a version of fighting the last battle. We thought, oh, 2013 Fed taper tantrum led to a big thing. Therefore, again, it happens. And, and the circumstances are very very different from then. One, you know, the taper tantrum in 2013 was unexpected. This time, you know. This is all, you know, everyone is expecting it's only a matter of time and it's going to happen. So I think it's not going to be an unanticipated shock, which I think was. Second, India's macroeconomic situation is, you know, day and night, uh, or night and day. Uh, you know, there our inflation was very high, uh, our current account deficit was very high, we were relying on capital. And, you know, uh, so now that's not the case. Our macroeconomic situation is completely different, you know, growth, inflation, everything. But I think. The third reason, of course, is that you know even if interest rates go up, what I said earlier, I mean, you know, remember, you know, uh, you know, this is a joke I've said many times. The, the, the economist's wife turns to the economist and says, "Honey, do you love me?" And he says, "Relative to what?" So this is a question, you know, uh, you know, in that's still relatively, you know, attractive. You know, so the fact that interest rates go up, yes, there will be some, might be some, but in a broader perspective, from the point of view of the investor, I think India is still. Uh, uh, a country that you would want to, you know, invest your money in. Uh, I think the question is that on equities, yes, but on debt, there's a lot of carry and all this stuff happening. Will that go away and will that make a difference? A lot of corporate debt and stuff like that. Yeah, so, so I think some amount of, uh, you know, uh, flow from debt markets could happen. And it has happened to some extent. It has happened already. But I think, you know, it, it's nothing order that's going to really fundamentally create so much volatility. There'll be some. Uh, that's part of you know the, the hurly burly of how financial markets uh, operate. So I, I don't think it's going to. Yeah, I'll ask a last question before the floor opens. What exactly is this panga with RBI you have on the interest rate? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and my, my and, and and my question is what panga you know? <laughs> no, this this will because we're all common people, right? So we don't understand all this argument. Can you explain in simple layman language what is this issue? Oh, I mean, what is the issue? I think I want to stress here that Anandan is, you know, uh, dragging me into dangerous territory. Uh, <laughs> but you see, you, you when you want to fight inflation, and India's inflation is very high, has has been very high, and you know it's still higher than most emerging market countries. It's very, still very high. So you want to be able to you know curb inflation and one way you do that is by saying that you're going to offer savers enough money to make it attractive for them to put money in banks and, and not to spend it and that's how you kind of control inflation so in order to be able to uh, to make it attractive for people to save money and put it in the bank you have to a, a, a return that's high enough and that's why to bring down inflation you raise interest rates because then it actually becomes attractive for savers to save and to put money, and that's how. Okay. 
So the question is, but in this instance, what is happening is that from the point of view of savers, you know, uh, the, the, the return is about two, two and a half percent or something like that. But from the point of view of producers was, who are investing, uh, you know, they are having for their cost of borrowing for, from their point of view is a bit different because exactly, you know, they are selling goods and services whose prices are actually, you know, declining sharply. So, so that's the disjunction at this moment that, you know, normally all these prices would move together. And so, you know, the way you need to tackle inflation for savers or, or how you need to make attractive savers is how it has to be, you know, how firms view this as well. But now we're at a situation where it's somewhat different. Uh, and that's really the, the, the fact that from the point of view of savers, it's very oh, different. Any, any questions from the audience? Mulyar, not about privatization, not about circular rail. <laughs> And also, so one one request. I have one request. Yeah. That um, questions, not statements. Uh, you know, uh, because there are lots of people who want to ask questions. You know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We'll ask okay. people. people uh, upstairs. Okay. And, and brief and brief. So that we can have more people ask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Manmohan Singh government was uh, faulted for reform by stealth. Okay. And uh, I mean, apparently, this government is also more or less doesn't seem to be, you know, convinced that uh, reform should happen uh, by, you know, by the proper way. Uh, for instance, Bibek, they, they probably gave a report. And the very next day, Suresh Prabhu goes around in, in uh, uh, goes around saying that, you know, I mean, no, 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 no privatization, no privatization, you know. But the Bibek, they probably said that was almost everything was saying for privatization. And it's, it happens that way. And Believe another me. instance is this ordnance factories. I mean, there's a discussion saying that ordnance factories today are producing World War II kind of instruments. Why are they still operating is the question I would ask. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, um, you know uh, fi finally, I think, you know, um, one should look at look at you know whether reform is happening or not. You know, if reform is happening uh, directly by stealth, uh, I, I think uh, those are choices that governments make based on what they think are you know the serious and binding political economy constraints on them. And, and you know, so so uh, I think one has to be pragmatic about this. That you know, if you can only get reform in a slightly indirect way, you know, fine. Uh, as long as we get reform, I think that's what needs to needs to happen. I think on privatization, if you know, <clears throat> the, the policy of this government as enumerated in the budget is that, you know, we are uh, going to, uh, uh, the, the disinvestment effort is going to be much bigger this year than last year. And the disinvestment effort will include strategic signals as well. So I think <clears throat> in the spirit of, of, of incrementalism or, you know, or, uh, you know, small art short steps, I think, again, this is uh, going uh, forward relative to last year. Now, I think the question is why not bolder and bigger privatization? And, and that's a question. And I think that's, you know, it, it, it partly depends upon, you know, the zeitgeist and, and, you know, is India, you know, in the popular imagination, is that, you know, something that resonates or not? And I don't know the answer to the question. I mean, uh, when you privatize, especially for the big, big uh, companies, you know, there is going to be a lot of resistance from uh, labor. And how do you, you know, deal with that? And that's a political question that people have to answer. And uh, um, but I think within that, I do think there is space for, you know, thinking about where you can do it with lesser political costs or at least perceived political costs. And I think uh, I think the, the art of policy making or the craft of policy making is in fact find you know those areas where you know you can both uh, do stuff you know minimize per perceived political cost and you know privatization may be one of those cases or how do we get someone from the other room to ask you just put them on yeah yeah is anyone there yeah there'll be people there yeah. okay i think uh, i think uh, nitin pai our own resident think tank takshila nitin I just wanted to get your thoughts on how do you, no, my, how my, do my, you look at uh, 
how do you look at uh, defense uh, allocations? Because there's this uh, traditional mindset that it has to be 2% of GDP, right? and then you move up and down. But have you uh, have you put some thought into how do you allocate no, no, money for defense? That's above my pay grade. I mean, uh, defense, I, I don't get into defense allocations. You know, I mean, I mean, if anything, uh, you know, uh, maybe I'm encroaching on stuff even in the survey that I shouldn't be. So, but defense is not one of those. So, I, and I honestly haven't thought about that. Thanks. Yeah, gentlemen, with the. Yeah, you. Can I ask a question about the Make in India policy? Is that fair terrain? Sure, sure. Yeah. So the Make in India policy seems to be uncoupled from discover in India and innovate in India. There seems to be a complete uncoupling. Would you a agree with that? And if you or elaborate on a response on that? You know, I I think of India uh, Make in India as I understand it. No, I, 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 this is how I understand Make in India as essentially trying to address this problem. How do you make the Indian economy globally competitive? And I, I think so, that's the vision, I think. Uh, how do you actually uh, translate that into public policy to facilitate that? I think there, there can be you know, different views on how to make that happen. And I think you know, uh, the, the, my own view would be that you know, that requires you know, creating the infrastructure, creating the skills, so skills India is certainly for me a part of Make in India, uh, you know, and and uh, similarly, you know, just ease of doing business, creating infrastructure, all those things. You know, if you take uh, stuff that you know, India becomes so uncompetitive on a number of grounds. You know, delays, uh, availability of power, availability of logistics. You know, so I see essentially Make in India as addressing all those things in order to get our economy to be globally competitive, and you know. Innovate in India, I think, yeah, I, I think skilling India, innovating in India, all, all part of that. Um, so so uh, it's, it's a vision, it's a vision to make the economy competitive. And uh, uh, unless, you, you know, you have to, your own question, I have to, you know, formulate it as what is it that you think the, the policies that need to be implemented or not in order to make this happen? Uh, so that's, I think, the way I think about it. Well, you talked about 1% GDP transfer to the states. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the GDP percentage in China, which has an effective science and technology policy, we are one fourth of this investment in science and technology. As a percentage of GDP, I think they're at about 2%, we're at about 0.4 or something like that, and, and stat now over the last 10 years. So, I mean, there's clearly an uncoupling with any kind of manufacturing and Make in India. So, so, let me make a slightly controversial point, and, 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 here, and, and, and Nandan will be very happy with me. See, if you, if you look at the history of development, right, the Industrial Revolution led to this, what we call the Great Divergence. You know, some countries innovated, went far ahead, and others, you know, what are today the developing countries, lagged behind. After World War II, what we saw was we had this distribution where there were some guys at the frontier and some guys lagging behind, and then these guys lagging behind are trying to catch up to the frontier. Now, the pattern of post-war, this catching up of the poor towards the rich, has basically relied on attracting capital, providing relatively cheap infra uh, labor and good infrastructure to converge to uh, the uh, you know the frontier. There is no as experience as far as I know where that moving rapidly towards the frontier has been of poor countries has been based predominantly on innovation and science and technology. Now you might argue that things are different now that India should be different on that score and that's a conversation we could have. But the pattern has been you know, create the conditions for if you want especially if you want inclusive growth you have to create the conditions where the vast bulk of your labor can be profitably employed that's the pattern of of convergence now india has defied that because india has not grown based on you know providing opportunities for its unskilled labor it's done it basically by creating many more opportunities for its skilled labor and that's you know it I, I, I'm not going to say it's good or bad, but it certainly has benefits and costs. But the predominant pattern has not been based on emphasizing innovation at, at the time of converging to the frontier. As you get closer to the frontier is when you start innovating. 
Okay, so maybe we'll maybe let's have questions from the other rooms. Uh, two three questions because they deserve. A, how do we get them in? Can somebody come in? Can it come out? Question? Uh, yeah. Just 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 put the word for the very much. Yeah. Can can we have questions in that room, please? No, they're live, but they kind of there, there's a there's a there's a time lag between here. Okay, keep going on. No, anyone? Okay. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> they are doing their own. One minute. Uh, okay. Why don't Why don't you ask? Two days before the this last budget. Hmm. Uh, the method and the baseline for the calculating the growth was changed. So, could you just explain in brief, you know, what essentially does the, does it actually mean? Yeah. So, so you know, firstly, it's, the way you put it was very uh, interesting, but loaded. You know, the 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 point was that this was th these changes uh, that were happened in January, a few days, but announced, I think, 29th or 30th January, had actually been set in motion years ago. Uh, so, so you know, I, w I want to dispel any conspiracy theories here that, you know, it was done just before the budget. You know, it started two, three years ago. Essentially, it was an effort by our statistical office, which is fantastic, to get India's methodology and practices in line with international best practice. So, th they were you know, a couple of, you know, things that had to be changed. One was the methodology, which I don't want to get into, is too, too arcane. But the second big thing that happened was that the data that we used for doing this, you know, increased enormously. You know, for example, for the uh, 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 data on, on, on the private corporate sector, the data that you elect, we went from, you know, basing our estimates uh, on a sample of, I don't know what, uh, maybe 50, 60,000 to a sample of six lakhs. So the coverage of the data expanded quite a bit. Now, <clears throat> you know, I, I like to say, and you know, the, the effort was outstanding. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, the integrity of a statistical office is impeccable, but it's, it, it resulted in estimates, you know, especially for certain years that were quite high. And that seemed, you know, to be, uh, kind of puzzling when you looked at other indicators uh, in the economy at the same time. So, so I, I, in a sense, that's what we're trying to, you know, s struggle our way through, that, you know, these new estimates. So what happened was that the estimate for 2013-14 was, I think, revised upward from about 5 point, um, uh, it, it, it was increased by about 1.7 or 1.8 percentage points for 2013-14. And, and, and so the question was, why did that happen? And I think we're still looking into that. Uh, um, so, so that's why I want to be very clear is that I, I like to see, you know, I understand numbers in terms of the changes, but I think we're still trying to understand, you know, the absolute level of these growth numbers. Yeah. Got a question? Yeah, uh, I want to ask. Uh, wait, 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 wait. In India. Your, your turn. Uh, yeah. I want to ask about Vic in India. Yeah, somebody what is the Vic? Okay. I think might as well have that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. What? Uh, you told me best. Uh, Said everything works here. Yeah, I Good. Uh, Dr. Subhanu, my name is Vasanthi. I'm an independent journalist. My question has got to do with subsidies. It's a political one, but I'd love it if you give your frank take. Recently, I was in Kodakanal uh, as part of a holiday, and I saw the Amma Idli Center. I got very curious. The next morning, I thought I should stand in the queue, get in, and see what it's like. Uh, very clean stuff and very good, and value for money. Under 10 including tiles, adam, and samba rice. Now, as a journalist, I had a discomfort with subsidies. Mm -hmm. But then when I saw that, OK, the poor having their food with dignity and access this one, and then your presentation, you made a point about economic decisions and the relationship with political decisions. Now, 
how do you see this? I mean, you see this as an example for other states to emulate? Because I don't understand. I'm not a student of economics at all. But I just saw that um, Karnataka did make a shusha about uh, Anna Idlis to counter Amma Idlis. But um, how do you see this? I mean, is this like, you know, the whole gamut of Amma medicines and water and all that? Uh, at least it least seem to be reaching the targets. I don't know about the other things. How do you look at it? Uh, is it good for the economy as well? You know, you know, this is a, it's a you know, it's, it's a, the reason I'm stumbling shows you it's a very good question, you know, uh, because my mind is kind of willing as to what I can say and what I cannot say. Uh, uh, so, and I'm being honest about that. So, so I think that, you know, it is true that when these midday meal schemes were first introduced, that your, your standard liberal economist was against that. And it turned out that the experience, at least for those, some of those schemes, were, actu were actually, in terms of nutritional outcomes for children, were very positive. So I think we have to be a little bit uh, humble and pragmatic about how we uh, assess these things. Um, <clears throat> now, the thing about, you know, at some stage you have to ask, you know, is it being done effectively? And I think we need to monitor that, and we need to see how it's happening. And I don't know enough about the Idli situation, although I also hear that you know uh, the Idlis are very good in these uh, in these restaurants, in these uh, things. The question, you know, certainly in the case of Tamil Nadu, the question is, you know, at some stage, you, you know, what are the opportunity costs of doing this? Um, and I think that's the tough question that you know. Uh, at one level, some people benefit a lot, but the question is that you know, are there ways of accomplishing that objective, at, you know, at lower political and economic cost? I think that's the calculation that one has to do, and that's going to be very state specific, very circumstance specific, and you know, that's why I don't think there's any good general response to that. Um, so, so, so you know, you've given that case, like the kerosene case, where you know. We know there are leakages, we know, you know, or, or some other subsidies where it doesn't happen. So, you know, I can be more confident based on the data and looking at that, that those are, you know, need to be reformed. In this case, you know, I, I, I'm genuinely, you know, puzzled and, you know, would like to study it much more. No, but remember, 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 and there, there I have an answer to. I said, not always, but all, at all times. Uh, uh, you know, on, 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 in this, so that's why the, we hide behind averages because they, on average it's good. But in this particular case, you know, much tougher call. You know? Okay, so I think uh, we have a question from the. So there, so there are two questions. Actually, it's from a CEO who's upstairs and not able to get on the board. So first question is the back economy impacts both make in India as well as tax revenues. Do you have any innovative solutions about this? The second, he said that you mentioned that CAD is no longer an issue. He feels that uh, you could be wrong. Oil prices are down, so is gold, and decisions are based on fear. And therefore, there's a little bit of comfort out there. So these are the two questions. Yeah, let me take them in reverse order. Yeah, uh, I mean there will always be discomfort because I think you know in this world, you know, as Andy Grove famously said, only the paranoid survive. So we have to be paranoid. But I think that, you know, take each of the, the gold and, uh, see, remember, the current account went up in these years for three reasons. One was gold, one was uh, uh, oil, and the other was, you know, a whole set of things related to, you know, decisions that led to iron ore export, you know, what we would call implementing, uh, you know, challenges at that stage. Uh, on gold, and uh, oil. Uh, le let me say the following. See, gold, remember, the, our demand for gold went up then for two reasons. Gold prices were rising, so it was seen in investment. And second, inflation was very high, so it was a, a good inflation hedge. What you see in the last few months, the decline in gold, is actually completely uh, consistent with that assessment. Gold prices have come down, so as an investor, 
domestically inflation has gone down and therefore people don't want to hold inflation as well. So, you know, as long as macroeconomy is stable, I guess about if really April and May figures, May and June figures, gold have uh, things that stabilized consistent with that assessment. On oil, I, I think it's uh, uh, my own assessment, which is consistent with, you know, uh, it's not my assessment, but what I read is that, you know, there have been fundamental shifts in the market for oil. You know, demand has come down, but I think much more important, this whole technology revolution, the shale revolution has, you know, altered this fundamentally. And of course, you know, this is something that's a bit more speculative, but we also, people tend to think that, you know, the whole OPEC and Saudi Arabia as a swing producer has changed fundamentally. Now, sure, things could turn around and things could happen, but I think all the expectation is that, you know, uh, yes, oil prices would go up, but given these fundamental changes, you know, the likelihood of it going up anywhere beyond 80 or 80 is relatively and as long as oil prices stay, don't go beyond that, I think uh, we can make economics reasonably comfortable. The other one was the black economy. See, I don't understand black economy. You know, I, I, I know that politicians are, are, are very, uh, uh, they kind of spend a lot of money and time on it. I, I think. I, <laughs> see, I, I think that less less facetiously. I, I mean, I, I, what I would say is this: I think the way to think about black money, you know, there's a stock problem, the flow problem. There's a stock problem, you know, which you have to be seriously addressing. The danger is that, you know, in trying to address that, you could actually compound some of the perceptions about India, you know. For example, you know, our tax system is still seen as, you know, somewhat arbitrary, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, the whole black money, going after black money could play into that. And, and, and I think we need to be very careful about that. But I think the much more important thing about black money is to understand, you know, why do we cr create black money in the first place? And let's address those things that create rather than, you know, uh, so, so to me, black money is much more important in terms of it uh, signals about the conditions, what we're doing that give rise to, uh, you know, arbitrariness, tax rules, discretion, corruption, all of those things that give rise. I think we need to be very serious about addressing them. What, what I would say about Dr. Rao, you had a question. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, you rightly uh, praise the role of the public sector, making Bangalore what it was 50, 60 years uh, That certainly is not the case all over the country today. Uh, many estimates suggest that the public sector is responsible for not adding something like 1.5% to GDP. You have the same thing in infrastructure investments. You showed the numbers on social benefit schemes, huge amount of leakages. So my question to you is, why is it that economists do not think about management, uh, about implementation, about how to accountability uh, and make it very strong? Uh, it's not a question of privatization. It's a question of making things work and making people responsible and accountable. Uh, and that seems to be something which the economic survey our government is talking about. I, I think that's a, that's a really... Uh a uh, very good and very insightful point. I think, uh, uh, you know, my friend Desh Kapoor has a very similar view that, uh, you know, we economists, you know, we're very comfortable talking about incentives, but we have, I think, much less to say, say about actually building capacity and improving implementation. Uh, I think we have much less to say about that. But there, I think that, so, I would say is that that's why I feel that the whole Aadhaar thing, why I, I'm such a you know big uh, fan of that, is that it's one of those instances where we have improved state capacity by, in this case, deploying technology. Uh, you know, I, 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 among the other things. Correct. Uh, so, 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 so you know, uh, all we can do is to chip away. You know, for example, you know, instead of giving 
the tehsil the, the right to determine beneficiaries if you could make that online if you make that online and you know bypass him that would be a way of doing it but i think we need to focus more on you know i certainly think agree we need to devote much more time to institutional reform you know how do you reform the judiciary how do you reform the police i think these are things we need to spend much more time on and and i think I, I, honestly i think economists have a role to play but it's not clear that they have you know now for example behavioral economics is becoming uh, uh, very important in terms of what it, it can say about you know how do you bring about social change and, and frankly i think economists don't have a really um, super robust uh, uh, or super insightful things to say about what brings about change uh, theories of change i think it's a much more you need a much more holistic approach to that okay we have time for three questions i don't think that stuff is working yeah, yeah, right so one from here one from here one from here. so nobody uh, this thing Sp special uh, yeah. discrimination so we have a visiting international uh, shwashne here from brown university uh, Uh, the question can you hear me yeah sure yeah the question about um, the idea that this is becoming good politics today of late it has become and i want to become, take become, becoming is becoming becoming become, becoming <laughs> yeah. in process it's in process so i want to take this idea towards agriculture sector mm -hmm. and uh, the the economic survey that you drafted um, talked about how price subsidies to agriculture both input and output have a uh, wasteful economically and uh, india needs to talk more about or indian uh, policy makers need to think more carefully about public investment in agriculture um, no, research I research irrigation etc now uh, it is um, even if one agrees with this and actually i do even if one agrees with this is it politically very hard to go through the investment route and easier to go through subsidies price input subsidies and and correctly manage the economic point you know i i think that uh, i guess what uh, i think is that you know with subsidies you you can you know use the direct attribution of it to outcome and so in that sense it's easier public investment returns are delayed benefits are more diffuse uh, and therefore uh, <clears throat> now i think that's not just true of agriculture that's true much much more that's why we see decline in public investment over the years snack agriculture but across the board but it's certainly true <coughs> as well um see i i don't have uh, to, to me actually the the the, the politics of reforming subsidies are fiendishly complex and and i completely agree with that and i think is 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 is, is perhaps at least for now the only way forward on you know provided you can show that in the cash i think that and so i would say that once you can do that then actually you know maybe public investment is going to be uh, more easy to do but remember really in some ways public investment in agriculture remember uh, just to step back and answer the question it was not so difficult this year to make the case for public investment in infrastructure uh, I, i think because there is a certain continuity in the ideology which still believes that you know the state can spill spend uh, and therefore you know public it's much more difficult to uh, you know ask government to eliminate subsidy than it is to get them to invest in infrastructure because i think spend still uh, not so, so difficult of course spending money via subsidy is is easier but spending money via public investment is not that difficult uh, you know you still do get political payoffs from from spending money uh but i think you know it's uh, uh the uh the benefits of spending 
NDA one government in rural road has paid off enormously. And, and I think politicians do see that having paid off and having, you know, uh, paid off not just economically but also politically. But so, yeah, uh, it, it lost, but I think. Uh, okay, I think uh, Kuru won't talk to me unless I let him ask. Kuru. You have a loud voice here. Hello. Very high India's rating high on bad loan provisioning. Now the banks have asked for a raise in equity, and I understand some seventeen thousand to twenty thousand crores is going to come in. Um, is it going to write off these NPS or more of the NPS and and uh, funnel into the social schemes, the PMJDYs, and all the other uh, pension and other? Schemes are going into as a industry is not growing, export is not growing because not enough money in money is growing for those investments. So isn't there a contradiction here? You know that you know. Do we need to spend money on recapitalizing the banks? Is that the question? Yeah, that is one. Would it go for going for that or would it go for growth? Because product raising productivity, raising their profitability, profitability is all banks is way down. So I, I think that some would say that uh, you know recapitalize the banks is necessary to boost investment and growth. So that, I think, is a... Uh, uh, so, so there the question is, you know, what is the, the right way and what is the timing for that? I think, you know, Raghu himself said recently that at this stage, you know, the binding constraint on further private investment is, is not lack of credit from the banking sector. Um, I think once growth takes off, I think it will become more of an issue. And I think at that stage, have to start thinking about how banks can contribute more credit and finance the growth. Um, and it's going to involve a lot of trade-offs. Uh, for example, you know, should banks raise money on their own? How much should the government support it? You know, how should that support be distributed between good banks and not so good banks? Uh, I, I think these are going to be, you know, tricky questions that are going to Remember, we don't want to do it in a way that you know, creates the same incentives that we had in the past. That you know, do blanket recapitalization, and then you get the same kind of uh, you know uh, has landed up landed us in the current such predicament that we have. So I think it's not the burning issue for now. I think uh, cleaning up the banking system is going to be a, a medium term, not not quite at this stage. Okay, okay. last last. Yeah, I sir, think sir, I'm Sanjeev sir, from third floor. Uh, my question is. Uh, the efficiency and loss of productivity across the country over a period, which is affecting in a big way the economy and the past government, the present government, they are not taking anything on the headway. Looking at the way Japan is doing on these parameters, how our country can into the completely in, in terms of economics. Can you throw the like this? Uh, Next question. Huh? I, I think you're you're asking a, a kind of fundamentally unanswerable question about no but uh, if you look uh, at how, the, how do poor countries become no, rich all this like uh, other other things are uh, offshoot of these uh, in inefficiency corruptions and loss of property today like a uh, bangalore every citizen is affected by urban transport the loss of property is so high and uh, rules are not able to have a clear city if you look at that the the it's uh, enormous economic uh, we are losing in this if you look at the japan they are much ahead on this. If you, once the government is not taking head on on this, anyway, I, I think he is not the right guy to answer that. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, Prem, you said you, you've been raising your hand, and this 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 needed one. So look yeah. at that. Yeah, isn't it true that the historical record on countries moving from an un underdeveloped to developed status one of the key factors has been uh, substantial investment and capacity building in the areas of education and health. And are we perhaps moving in the wrong direction there? And uh, related to that, why is the economic debate centered so much on the measure of growth rather than broader measures such as the Human Development Index? Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think both are really very good questions. Uh, 
you know, I, I think that we need to assess progress and development in many, many dimensions. I mean, it's just, uh, uh, that's just absolutely right. And uh, growth is one of them. I, I think to some extent, I think uh, economists focus on that because they think that, you know, the impact of that, of growth in actually improving, uh, you know, livelihoods is, is perhaps quite big. And, and maybe it's, so it's maybe just a pragmatic reason. Um, and maybe to some extent it's this, you know, where's the key, uh, you know, where's, it's under the lamppost, you look under the lamppost, maybe because your, your, your ignorance about that is a little less than the ignorance about the, the other things that you, that you mentioned. Um, but I think on uh, the, 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 the record on, you know, social and uh, economic uh, educational indicators, I think those are absolutely, you know, uh, fundamental to, to, you know, develop in a broad sense. And I think, you know, uh, the, the reason to focus, you know, in a sense, your two questions are, are related. I think we need to focus on health and education for pure intrinsic reasons. I mean, it is a dimension of development and betterment. And so in itself, it's very important. But then also, it, it has an impact on development and growth via productive, better health, and so on. So I think for both reasons, I think we need to and the only thing I would say that I, I um, we need to understand more, you know, once these 14 Finance Commission recommendations play out, we need to understand, you know, how much actually spend is increasing or decreasing on these because now more is going to be done by the state because they're going to get more money. So, okay, absolutely. The last question, uh, Narendra Pami, in honor of Bangalore, we are in this side of town, and, uh, you know, the resident intellectual at NIAS. No, actually, I just wanted uh, to know whether you're, when you're deciding on DDT, are you looking at the secondary effects of that? For instance, you showed a massive drop in LPG. That demand is obviously going somewhere else and creating inflationary pressure elsewhere. Are you in the finance industry or in any other uh, department of the government trying to evaluate that and take it into account when you're making your decision? Actually, that's a, a great question because what we find is that although subsidized domestic sales came down by 25%, it didn't lead to a one-to-one -one increase in commercial sales, subsidized domestic sales. So where did it go? Did it yeah. go to some other cookies? So, so it's a very good question. And what you basically find is that the supply to the black market actually goes down and black market prices go up by this. So essentially what we need to do more is to do is to see whether who has whose demand has actually come down is it you know the the guy the rich guy who was you know buying on the black market or could it be that the tailwala who wasn't eligible for this who was getting it the black market he was in fact and that's why this concern about guarding against genuine exclusion is actually very important uh, and so we cannot easily say that this is all good we need to be, yeah, and so it's a very good question. Okay, so I think uh, we have come to the end of the program. Uh, Ravi Chandar of BIC, and a little Chandra, he was his early classmate in Ayan Mangabad. So he's going to end the evening. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming on behalf of BIC and IHS. <coughs> I want to thank uh, Nandan for chairing the session, and Arvind for choosing to come to Bangalore last on this business <laughs> talk tour about this. Ending on a personal note, there's another hypothesis that's got validated today when I saw these two that you don't need to attend MBA classes to come good in life. Nandan never wanted to do an MBA. I am in the MBA class. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this has been a full house. We hope to see you back when we run this this kind of event. Thank you so much.